Hi everybody, welcome to uh, what is unbelievably the last first Friday of 2021 and um, I when we started doing these events online uh, back in May of last year I didn't quite believe it would be we'd still be doing them online now but anyway uh, here we are and it's great that being online we can welcome people from much further afield so it's great that everybody's here uh, lovely to see you um, I just want to say before we begin oh, by the way I'm Richard Paval uh, from art.earth and um, do use the chat do feel free do feel free to use the chat to make comments or to ask questions um, we have uh, three guests today uh, Ellie Lestis and uh, David Bickley and Sophie Mason uh, welcome uh, to, to those and welcome to everyone else thank you uh, very much for joining us so we're going to start um, uh, with Ellie so Ellie I'm going to hand over to you you are coming uh, today from uh, Cyprus is that right yeah okay yes yes um, hi <laughs> yes um, hi everybody, um, as Richard just said, I am currently living in, in Cyprus and uh, thank you Richard for giving me you know, the opportunity to present some of what I've been doing here, very different to what I was doing in England for sure. Um, so um, I'm going to just read a, a little statement first and then is it okay if I if I start the screen share now so that I can have the first um yeah absolutely of course the first one up which um oop, there okay so so uh sorry about information that that we don't really want but at least we, we can see the first image so if I could just rest on this image first and and speak a little bit about uh, my, my latest work is what I call rock drawings and um, I'm going to leave this up just for a minute while I, I read this. Uh, the rock drawings came into being as a body of work as the result of a few years of my own artistic evolution. The concept was not thought out or preconceived but rather emerged and flowed from one thing to the other. So um, this image here shows how through a series of events, I eventually ended up with drawing on this found object. I found this throne in the garden. And um, as a result of, of placing drawings on stone walls. We have a lot of buildings here with traditional stone walls and one of the places where I work. And the drawings seemed to come to life because they were on the wall. And I started to, to, to look for objects around that I could draw on that were not paper and not canvas. And I came across this, this cube thing here it's a, an old planter, it was thrown around, and I thought, well, what happens instead of a wall if I draw on this? So I did. Later I discovered it was actually asbestos, which um, shocked me in the beginning, but also led me to find out that there was a very rich history of asbestos, which is a natural fiber in Cyprus. And I sealed, I found more of those and I started to seal them and then draw on them. Um, but this wasn't the thing. The thing was that when I placed this planter outside with the very strong light and shadows that from the sun we get here, the image or the photograph started to also be important. So um, I, I work across quite a few media uh, forms. I draw, I manipulate natural objects and photography. So it could be all of those things like it is in this one. So if I go to the next one, <coughs> again, 
outside the studio, same thing, still working with light and dark. But in this case, um, there was one of the, the rock drawings that started to be more my my collaboration. So maybe I'd just like to say a few a few words about that now. Um, I collaborate with nature. Therefore, it's not about being influenced or imitating nature, but um, rather being in a symbiotic relationship. So um, I, I take, I'm going to go on to the next one because this is, I take objects, real objects from nature. I take them back to the studio and I feel my way around what's happening with them. I don't like to take credit for my work being just my work. It, it, it's if it wasn't for what I was taking from the landscape, it would not it would not exist. I don't just draw the landscape. So I I took a lot of these seed heads back to the studio and started to work with them. Um, in one instance, you'll probably see it in, in the next slide, but just to tell you, I would manipulate the natural objects, uh, bring them to a place that I thought looked good, and then take them back to the original place where I took them from, which means that um, taking a photograph is the only way to be able to present this on site work. So this is the next one. So you can see it's back in the environment where I, I, I got them in the first place. So I didn't leave them there, but if I had, then they would blend in with the surroundings. They would blend in with the other wild growth there. Um, so I take and then I, I put back. Now, while, while manipulating, there's one more of those, there we go, while manipulating them, um, in order to, 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 to work with the objects that I, I take, in, in this instance, this object has this lovely structure that, that goes down and it's like a warp, so it seemed quite natural for me, I have a textile background anyway, to start weaving with yarn in and out of this natural warp with my own weft and making, um, oh, that is that one. Oh, I think you in, one, in the past one, you can see in some areas, a weave starts to form um, by, by using the weft in and out of the, the warp. Okay, so, then if I go to the next, okay. So here, here was when I was putting the drawings on, on a wall and letting the light and dark flicker, a, a bit like cave paintings, which came into my mind later. I take videos, I take photographs, and there was resonance, not just because of the drawing, but also because of the light and dark. So it's the whole, it's the whole package. It's not just the drawing or a framed drawing. I'm getting away from gallery um, nonsense in some way. And then this is, okay, so there's the lizard. This is the lizard on paper, a drawing, pencil drawing on the wall. Um, the photography being a big part of it because, again, it's the light and shade. And it, it, it just, the more realistic it looks, the better it was for me at this point. Okay, so now I'm going to go actually onto the rock drawings. So again, back to the collaboration with nature where I, I feel my way around what, what the natural object that I have found is doing and what it might be saying to me. So this close-up shows quite well how you still have the original pattern and form of the rock coming up through the drawing of this butterfly that, again, was in my experience. I took many photos of this butterfly as it was migrating through Cyprus about three, about three years ago. 
So again, I, I, this is the rock drawing. I've put it outside again with plants. So it's real, it's re is it real, is it unreal? It's an illusion. The photograph is important. There's lots of things I think um, in play with this work. Uh, people do think they're real quite often as well. Okay, so then um, it progressed from there and apart from creatures, then I, I, <coughs> I did this feather because I have a collection of feathers and when you see a feather on, on the ground, I think you want to pick it up. And the idea came and I just thought I, I, I wanted to do it and so, and so I did. Um, okay, uh, there's another lizard again this was a second lizard wanted it to look realistic it's leaning against the the base of a, a big plants that I have outside my studio and there was the first one so I work with with the stone with the rock and this one again realistic the photograph being important these moths do, they settle somewhere and you suddenly realize that they're there. Uh, we have this one in Cyprus and I had a whole series of photographs and it just seemed right. This marble uh, I've had as, as a stone for years, just taking it from one place to the other because I like it and it was a risk to draw on it, but I took that risk and I think it worked out okay. A hawk moth, again, we have them just settle in places. Um, so it's another realistic interpretation. And then the, the whip snake. So the photograph of the way that they would naturally hide in a place like that is all part, part of the package. And that's the whole collection of what I exhibited, but I, I exhibited them in a space where I recreated plants, stones, and they were like in a natural environment. This was the collection just before I took them down to the, to the gallery. Okay, so this is important with the symbiotic relationship I have with, with the materials I work with. This stone, um, as I was imitating by drawing these shells, they're all drawn, um, I came to realize that I could feel something. I wasn't sure what it was. And if you just look at where those lines are down the center, uh, without knowing it was there, I realized that there was a, a partial fossil. And all I, I had to do was just like put white chalk on top really lightly and it made it come to the surface and then I just sealed it. So it became part of the artwork, that this is the whole artwork with something that's actually real plus drawn in the same, in the same piece. And again, just drawn shells because that's what they look like. There's areas in Cyprus where they would have been under sea level in the past, but now they're high and you, you find, it's very common to find fossils and white shells on those rocks above coastal areas. Now this is, and this is where I'm going to finish. Um, the very latest, because I'm co also concerned with threads of time linking work with the past, this is a drawn fossil. Um, I've been looking at images and feeling my way around how um, time is important in artwork anyway, but in this instance, I, I want that thread to be to be really obvious. So um, I, I've now changed track a little bit and have started to actually draw what is a time-worn thing, but it's being done now. This isn't a fossil, this is just a drawing of a fossil. And there's the last one. Um, again, it's it's I photographed it, so it's quite a nice image on top of the asbestos that I found where I drew moths. <laughs> so the actual image is a bit quirky also, and the, the stone on top 
is a found stone where I have drawn a fossil. And I think that's all I have to say, really. Thank you, Ellie. That's that was really, really interesting. It's a shame we couldn't see the images bigger. So perhaps you might send us a few and we'll put them up on the website and then people can really explore them. Oh, um, I'd love to, yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Uh, I do have a question from Lizzie who would like to know about what media are you using to paint with or draw with? Draw. Okay, acrylic didn't work terribly well. <coughs> I had um, problems with sealing and I did find a solution. Um, so I seal the stone, the area I'm going to work on before I work on it, then I draw, then I seal on top. So I've sandwiched the drawing in, in between. And I draw with all sorts of stuff and it's usually drawing materials pencil charcoal pastels um often tipex actually for really really strong things that then i can cover over with these and a little bit of acrylic they're not rock paintings they really are drawings so that's what i work with yeah Okay, thank you. A um, uh, question from Sophie, who'd, who'd love to know more about asbestos. She says she didn't, yes. she doesn't know it's a natural material. I think probably that's a question that quite a few people would have. Yeah, uh, I didn't know this either. I knew all the dangers. Uh, somebody mentions asbestos, and everyone's going, "Oh my God, it's dangerous! It's dangerous!" Um, now it, it turns out that it was very heavily mined here in Cyprus. It's mined. Um, it's a natural um, um, material that became very useful. And when Cyprus was still um, a colony, a British colony, uh, that they, when it, it got passed over to being independent, the asbestos mines were sold. I'm not sure to where, I'm afraid. I think it was to the Italians, I'm not sure. And by that point, the dangers had started to emerge. The dangers are that... Um, over time, it starts to just disintegrate. And if you inhale over years, then that's where the danger is. And it attacks the lung tissues and causes big problems. But um, in this case, this planter, I didn't realize, I thought it was concrete. Somebody, one person told me, then another person told me, and I thought, oh my God, it must be asbestos. <laughs> And so then I had to do a little bit of research and I sealed them so that nothing would fly off. Um, but again, you see this thing of finding materials rather than going to the art shop and buying canvas or buying paper. I liked the fact that I was able to disregard all that and I was able to go to what's around and it was nice that it was natural but they look really good these these <laughs> they're not that dangerous but uh yeah i see david david's just put a comment in to say it's only dangerous when it's cut um yeah, yeah, yeah. which is pretty much what you're saying really if you seal yeah. it i'm going to ask you one last question before we move on mm -hmm. and that's from jane um actually jane i'm going to uh, um, bring you in if you'd like to come in uh because it's it's uh uh let me see if i can find you that hi there hi jane hi <laughs> thanks for bringing me in richard yeah I, i'm just interested in asking you um what depth of photorealism do you aim for when you're when you're putting these um images on, on onto the chosen background um and going on from the previous point, how permanent are the drawings? And do are you considering the transient nature of the natural world when you create them? They're not permanent things, they're ephemeral and will be part of nature and then disappear. Well, I, 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 I'm hoping, you see, this is all tied in with the time thing. I've done my best to make sure that they remain there for a reasonable amount of time. Um, I think they could probably compete quite well with most paintings and drawings now. Um, and I, because they are in the end an art object, but actually if things do start to deteriorate, like you say, 
that's also part of the natural process. We love to find old Roman ruins with little bits of drawing, let's say. So either way, I feel I've done the best that I can so that they do stay for a long time, but at some point down the road, I presume that they they will start to go even deeper into the into the rock. Yeah. And sorry, the That's other interesting because I thought you might feel that, you know, they're works of art and then they, they have to be preserved and brought indoors. But you actually oh, they, leave them out in the no, environment. No, I, I don't leave them out. I put them there to take photographs. Uh, and I'm treating them as art objects now. And anybody that wants to, to, to buy one, I would say it, it's, it's an art object and to be cared for in the same way that you would care for a painting. They're not to be outside. They are art objects. They've taken an awful long time to do. Plus, of course, there's everything that I've done previously to lead up to this point. So it, it's my work, yeah. I think in other cases where I put things outside, again, to take photographs, um, yeah, nothing's remained outside yet for nature to take it over. I do, I do understand that some artists do do that, and I, I love a lot of that work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Um, I think we need to move on because time is moving on inevitably. So, David, I'm going to invite you to uh, join us now. And you are muted, so. There we go. Got you. So, uh, hi, everybody. So I'm in, in West Cork in Ireland, and I, I'm a a musician and a filmmaker and an installation artist um, working in, in those sort of three areas. So kind of for me, music and film is interchangeable. I see it's a very similar process, um, always kind of has been really. And I've been doing the two of those since I was 14, I think so in the mid seventies, I've been working in electronic music and in film it was obviously a lot more diff difficult in those days than it is now. So um, in my early practice was mainly using analog materials and obviously then moved into digital. I still try and encompass a kind of an analog sensibility into the work that I do. And so I'm trying to bring that intent through the kind of digital process because I see it, see them as being completely um, separate areas, really working with analog media. I mean, when you're when you're uh, shooting on real film, as you probably know from yourselves, shoot, shooting with uh, stills film or with with a uh, moving film, that you're capturing the moment. You're actually capturing light that's happening at that moment. Uh, and the same with sound. When you're recording on tape, then it's time because I'm winding over a certain amount of time. So whereas digital stuff is just purely uh, mathematics and doesn't really exist and is just. I won't say what it, what I think it is, but anyway, I obviously have to work in the in the digital world, and I'm just trying to say that that's kind of what I where I come from, what I try and put into my work. So I'm going to throw, show you three pieces here. They're kind of they're all a bit different. Um, so the first piece was made about in uh, 2013, I think, and it's an arts council funded project. So I actually had money to spend, but it wasn't really the money because I had all the gear myself and the expertise to do most of it myself. But it was really the uh, the time to, to be able to, to spend out in nature, in the landscape, just goofing around, you know, to spend ages and ages and ages. So I chose to, to make this film, I chose spots which were kind of close enough to me so I could go down every day and, um, you know, see what would happen. I was shooting a lot of time lapse. So this time lapse would take a long time. And I'd have a few different cameras set up and I would just really set them up and just sit in the landscape and observe what was going on. And, and nature really would, would make the film for me. It would just perform in front of the cameras. And then I would bring, come back and edit it. So the editing is obviously a long process, but most important to all of my work is, um, is the music really, because it's the foundation of the work. So I would always make the music first of all, and I would go somewhere that, that I found inspirational. So generally, uh, West Cornwall, or Penwith, down and right at the end of Cornwall, I would go to kind of write music. I find it really easy to write music there. Glastonbury, another place I go to a fair bit in England. Um, funny enough, I can't really write that kind of music in Ireland. 
don't know why. I don't really connect with the landscape in the same way. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I'd write the music first of all, and then that would lock down the vibe and I would know then what I was doing and I wouldn't change really the music throughout it. And then the editing would take a long, long time, a lot of processing involved and grading to kind of get the look. And so I, I paint, I did paint, I still do paint occasionally. And I'll try and bring some of these kind of painterly ethics into the way I edit. Um, but the biggest thing I suppose was me working in television for a number of years professionally. And that kind of instilled this sense of having everything perfect and finished, you know? So I'm gonna show the first film, which is the second movement of this film called Materials. And so Materials was really about my concept of nature, how we, how I see nature really. So I see nature as being quite alien to us. I don't see ourselves as being connected to, I think we've become disconnected. So I, I kind of, the importance of this work to me is to try and shape a kind of a connectivity between the human mind and nature. And I think in order to start doing that, you've got to kind of uh, recognize this alienation of ourselves from nature. So um, it, it reminds me of a, a, an old Hebrew, Hebrew text I, I came across ages ago, which said that when, um, when Adam was leaving the Garden of Eden, the angel on the gate said, Oi, Adam, if you ever want to come back in, you're going to need these. And he gave him the secrets of alchemy. And, you know, alchemy is, is all about a, a spiritual journey and uh, a change of consciousness uh, through symbolic m metaphor. So um, there you go. I mean, that to me kind of said it all, really, that a man, you know, it was an allegory about man being divorced from nature and the secrets of alchemy were the way back in. So there's a lot of that kind of in here. Anyway, stop talking, David. Play the film. All right. How do I do that again? Oh, share screen share and video and find the video which is here so this is called torrent and it's the second movement of materials okay and i hope you'll all be able to hear it
So it's probably important to say that 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 was really designed to be played in a dark room with really loud sound, yeah, and on a loop. And people, when they went into it, they kind of watched several cycles of it, really. And it kind of, kind of the more cycles you watched, the more it kind of worked. But it was a uh, five films, and it was telling a journey, really, a journey throughout the day, a journey from birth to death, a journey of some some kind. So the the second one is a bit more narrative, and this was. Um, this was this, during lockdown. I I joined Instagram just during lockdown. I left again just recently, and uh, primarily to meet new people to collaborate with online. So this was a, a woman who lives quite near me, but I've never met her. She's about an hour away, and she is from the Gira. So the Gira is uh, the, was the last alluvial um, forest in Europe. And in the 1950s, the ESB, the Electricity Supply Board here, uh, basically flooded the valley and destroyed. They chopped down all the trees and uh, moved all the people. And her family were some of the people that were moved. I mean, it's a terrible ecological disaster. But there are tiny bits of this forest left. And she she shot bits of it on just on a, a, an ordinary uh, high-definition camera. And um, so we made this film. Uh, and she shot, shot some still photos too. So it's basically all her images that I've processed and made some music to. And then we found this poem, uh, which is called The Lament of Art O'Leary, which is from the 1700s. And it's, uh, it just mentioned the gear. It's, he, was a, a re, um, he was a revolutionary, Art O'Leary. And um, the, the wife was living in the gear and she was moved. Uh, they knocked down the house. But it's just the... Um, it's just this, the poem resonates very clearly with the kind of the ideas. So we, well, I had it narrated in Irish and in English, and uh, we basically used the Irish for the when the shots of the old original forest and the English for the how it is now. So you can see the the contrast, and that's basically it was Irish language was being removed as the English were removing uh, the you know, the Irish language from the landscape. And so, anyway, I'll show that now. David, I'm just giving you a five-minute warning. Oh, Jesus, right, this is <laughs> short, short enough, so I'll just show this one, and that'll be it, all right? Sorry. Sing about videos as they... I won't play all of it, I'll just play a bit of it. OK, here you go. It's Ashling Trinailov. The January Adam. Last night, such opaque reveries appeared to me. A gurky, a jainak, a lab man. Night in Cork, as I lay awake, alone in bed, ger hitch our gorch elder, our bright limed home tumbling. and so on um so i'm just not going to play all of that because I, I don't have time so it was just the juxtaposition between the, the forest as it was originally and kind of how it is now and that was designed as a film to be shown uh, just as a film so the, the last one then i got time is another collaboration with an artist who i think is in norfolk or suffolk somewhere like that and she makes cyanotypes but they were i was just struck by the the clarity of them so these are all animated um, cyanotypes with a kind of mythic um, vibe. Hang on a sec. Where is it? Here we go. Unsupported format. I'll just have to share my um, share me uh, desktop then. Hang on. I have to share me desktop and share the sound. Okay. So this is. You can see this here. Thank you. 
That'll have to do. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Time goes on. Uh, yeah. What I wanted to say, David, is is the you know the quality that you get on Zoom is obviously not right. perfect, and uh, it would be uh, if you were willing to uh, put those make those available to us for even if for a yeah. limited period, we can. Put well, that, them up. Yeah, they're all, they're they're kind of in competition, but I will I'll I'll give you the links to the Vimeo uh, things, and you can look look at them. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah. there's loads of uh, loads and loads of comments coming in through the chat, um, most of which aren't really in the form of uh, questions, but um, lo lo lots of lots of comments about sound, about the kind of um, hypnotic nature of the the material, beautiful work, etc., etc. Um, I was very struck by the your decision to um, uh, shoot the, the torrent um, in that way, where, where essentially it was frame blended. So that you often see photographs like that, where the still image has, has kind of turned, turned it into a, a kind of liquid, uh, a silver, silver liquid. Uh, I've never seen video shot that way, so it was very interesting to... Uh, yeah, you can shoot time-lapse that way, yeah. long exposure time-lapse, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Lizzie says, uh, "Yes, for a moment I felt like I was drow drowning." <laughs> uh, that, that, uh, I love the uh, sort of semi-submerged camera, uh, camera or the where a moment it felt like we did go under underwater. Actually, yeah. Yeah, it was just a, a GoPro. So yeah, very simple the equipment, really, and just the the time. Yeah. Um, um, I'm going to ask one more question because uh, we. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm also trying to manipulate the screen here. Um, I say oh, everything that's coming. Oh, actually, there was a question from Catherine who says, What on earth are you doing in Cork, David? Me? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trapped in Cork. I'm uh, trapped in uh, If I could sell this house, I'd be out. I'd be living in <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Just sorry to interrupt, but I was intrigued by that. I mean, the minute you said you were in Cork, even before you got as far as saying you had landscape issues, I just, I just found that fascinating. Just fascinating that sort of awareness and mm. um, dislocation, wrong location. I don't know, a challenging location. It was just interesting. Yeah, well, we do have fantastic. I mean, I got like mountains, lakes, you know, big massive forests and all kinds of stuff all around me. It's kind of a really varied landscape. But uh, yeah, it's not like it's not like Cornwall. It's not like Dorset either. Is no. That? No. Can I draw attention to Sophie's question? She actually had a question. Oh, sorry. I, yes, please do. Very I, last I one, it. Sophie, saying, "What was that to me? Terrifying object spinning in the last ah, video." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was. Thanks. Uh, they're, they're just, uh, I don't know, I don't know what it is. They're just 3D objects. Um, you can buy them, basically. You can download 3D objects. I think they're in free, those ones. And you um, map the textures over them. I'm not a 3D artist. It's done in a really simple way. It's kind of fake 3D. And uh, it's just, I don't know what it is. It looks like a croissant, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know. But it's, I love the moon. It's like a moon shape, you know, and I love the moon in it. And uh, I don't know. It's we, got, I like the we, iconic, like an icon yeah. shape and feel of the whole thing. Yeah. And then we were seeing the cyan types in the background and also reflected on the object. Is that right? It's a little bit yes. hard to see. Yeah. Well, it's a yeah. it's a technique that uses the background to create the foreground. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Lovely. We should move on. Uh, thank you, David. That's great. Uh, moving swiftly on, uh, Sophie, I'm going to uh, uh, bring you in here. Hi, everyone. 
Um, thanks so much for having me. This is I we I um, joined Art Dot Earth really recently, so this is my first first Friday. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's not really a presentation. What I'm going to show you, it's more of a um, a request for feedback because um, it's not often I get the opportunity to be in front of so many artists. Um, so I'm going to show you my recent body of work and then some work that I haven't really shown anybody before. And it's it's not finished, it's their sketches, their ideas. So don't think about them as like finished pieces. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, so um, just to give you a bit of, context about my work before this um i'm um i was living in london as an artist and a food grower um and eventually working in kind of community gardens and i eventually brought those two together um and was doing kind of big collaborative participatory art projects in the space of a garden um thinking around climate breakdown and um community and all of those things and seeing how being in a garden kind of um, alchemizes, it sort of potentializes those conversations for change in a much kind of clearer way. Um, and then I got pregnant and um, we moved to Spain, my partner Spanish. And um, after I had a baby, um, I had much less time um, and I was in a new city, so I couldn't really do collaborative projects and I was very ill. And so I developed this new body of work and my daughter's now four. Um, so it's been like in the last four years um, and it came about, well, really from the need to do something very slowly. So it's very slow, this work sometimes. I mean, this piece here, it took about two or three years to make. Um, and um, it came, one of the things that influenced it was, I was wrapping my daughter in a blanket every time she went to sleep and it was a really beautiful blanket and my friend had given it to me and I noticed after a while it um, took on this, this um, measure of wornness, you know, and it was kind of the wearing away through care um, kind of like medieval icons, you know, those wooden icons that get shiny when they're touched or, or an old book. And I wanted to see if I could sort of um, do the same thing using the canvas, a mordanted canvas, as a kind of interface between my body and the, um, and the, um, who want to know um, my body and the landscape. So basically essentially these are just accumulative stains over years and years um, and you can see also that I've taken plants and minerals from the landscape and I've turned them into um, lake pigments and mineral pigments um, and I've painted on them as well um, so yeah this isn't these two were um, split between my time in Spain and then last year we moved back to the UK so in this one you can see this avocado stones and sun but there's also hail and snow so there's the Spanish and the English landscapes in there um yeah and it's really just um trying to um share that experience of being in the landscape um and it could it kind of tracks it becomes a kind of map of care and all of these things my body and so um yeah this is a very private part of my um of my work but it is quite performative and um there's a kind of embodiment that can happen that i don't share but i'm sharing with you because i thought perhaps there could be um Maybe the space for that in the work. I'm curious about your thoughts about that. So that's that's another thing. Um, this is another one that I made um, in the last two years, made from madder that I grew and brought with me, and lots of other things. 
And then um, this is another one that I finished this summer. Um, and basically, I've, I, yeah, I've loved making these and I love lifting up everyday objects and trying to, you know, they're a textile work in the end. They're very, very flat. And so I try to in, create some kind of um, texture around um, using everyday objects and lifting them up in a particular way. I studied in Italy for five years and, and then I lived in Spain for two years. And I think I'm quite influenced by the idea of altars and how when you place something at an altar, it asks you to look at it again. But um, yeah, I also noticed over the last few years that I, I placed a really strict ethical framework around what I consider to be a landscape and what's allowed into my landscape and what's allowed into my work, sorry, from the landscape and um, essentially what constitutes as nature. Um, and the more I the more I think about um, symbiosis and not being separate from nature and really embodying that, not just knowing it, which is kind of different, um, it feels important to try and be as honest as possible about what my actually what my landscape actually does look like. Um, and that includes my battle as a consumer, I think. And so this new body of work, which as I say, they're just sketches. Um, that's, a, that's a detail. Um, running out of battery, that's helpful. Um, this new body of work um, is um, an attempt to do that. So I've been, I've, I've been in this one, I um, stretched the blanket onto a wooden board and I, I've made a few of these um, and I, I created a kind of pocket and it's allowed, the, the, the board has allowed a lot more texture to be able to put in. So I've been putting in infant clothing and, and seeds and you know all kinds of stuff that I've been collecting. You can see there's a lot more um, texture to the work and it's, it's not there yet. It's the first time I've played with painting for a long time, but it's been really fun to have this new kind of materiality and also it gives me an opportunity to really bring in other materials around me that might otherwise be overlooked. So that's that one. And then um, this is the same again, but kind of playing with the, the altar quality, you know, the altar idea again. Um, yeah. That one's actually got less um, less less materials that I would have or wouldn't have. It's less not um, it's got so sort of a lot of natural materials in this one. But this last one um, is this one here is um, although not there at all. Is I really like the idea. It's um, essentially like a a letter or a package or a pillow or something. And inside it, I've put um, molehill soil and um, unrecyclable rubbish and um, flowers and wool um, and herbs. I have a chronic illness, so a lot of herbs go into my, um, into my work. And um, I sewed it up and I've, I've tried to paint on it and the painting hasn't gone so well, but I really like this idea of just, yeah, I'm really just trying to bring everything in and um, um, allow myself to consider what being natural is from that point of view and then to see where that goes. So that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. That was wonderful. Um, there's lots of, lots of um, comments again in the chat. I think a lot of people picked up on your comments about um, the, the the idea of an altar or the sacred uh, in the work mm -hmm. and um, people are, you can went you can have a look but people are using words like devotional um, uh, for me I loved the pockets I think the pockets do something that they 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 become embracing uh, that was particularly the one with the flowers it was actually just a kind of lifted corner, but 
it felt like there was some uh there was a real relationship that was quite extraordinary for me um uh, again quite a lot of comments on that uh, there was one question that we had um from alice who um quite a few people have responded to your very brief hints of your embodied work um <laughs> Alice, Alice would love to know: Are you wearing your the textiles when you're in there? Um, different things, but yes. And some of them have actually got holes in them so that I can put them over my head. Um, and then others, uh, I've wrapped them in. And and then others are smaller and they're harder too. But my my daughter joins me often, less and less. You know, she's four now, so she's starting to resist. Um, and I don't want to push it, but when she was younger, it was a way for us to to explore the landscape together. Um, so yeah, yeah, I do wear them. I think I think that there's quite a few uh, questions about that performative work. And and do you want to say anything more about it? Because you touched on it quite briefly, uh, and clearly, in some ways, it feels to me it feels very embedded in the work. So, um, do you want to explore it a well, little it's... bit more? Um, it's how I, it's, I think uh, I struggle to um, know how to bring such an intimate part of the work into a kind of gallery setting. Um, and, um, but it is how I make the work mm. um, or part of how I make the work. So um, that those stains that you know, part of the buildup of those stains. I'll often dye the, the fabric first with a, a, a material that I have around, you know, like onion skins or something I collected in Spain, pomegranates or something. Um, but then, yeah, a lot of the stains is just from being in the landscape and playing and, and having a child is makes that much easier. Um, and, and, it's, and I think recently trying to embody what it is to be an animal um, what it is to rest again, you know, when you're constantly faced with production and growth and all of that stuff. So things like that, that that's how it kind of comes about. But I, I haven't quite worked out how I feel happy to exhibit that or I, share that. I, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it's almost like uh, kind of brushwork. In yes, a way. exactly. Um, but, uh, you know, you described it when you were showing it as being personal. Um, and yet it's quite moving to see it. So, uh, mm. you know, I'm with you on your dilemma there. I, I, uh, I think just, just from the comments we've had back today, I think people are very interested in that and yeah, how you bring it, as you say, how you bring it in, if you bring it into the exhibition space is, is clearly something to grapple with. Um, uh, there are a few comments about uh, you, you know you may feel that the uh, the work is formative, but actually that the, there are some very strong responses to it that people feel some of it looks finished. Um, oh, great! Thank you. I think the for me the painting work is clearly a new departure, and mm. uh, it doesn't yeah it doesn't feel as refined yet. No. Uh, you know the staining and uh, is such an extraordinary process. And it was interesting to hear from you where it comes from. I'm talking away here. If anyone else would like to leap in, because there's so much stuff going on in the chat, it's a bit hard to uh, hold on to it. But, um, if anyone wants to jump in with a, a question or a comment, uh, please do. But I wanted to draw your attention to, because you mentioned having a chronic illness, and this is something that we yes. have been diving into with our borrowed time strand that finished a couple of weeks ago. Uh, quite a bit. And I want to draw your attention to uh, a poet whose name is Sophie Strand, and I'll put that name in the chat. Um, uh, clearly, her work is utterly different because she's using words. Um, but uh, it feels like there's some very strong threads there uh, with right. some strong connections to your work. So uh, you, you should find it easily. Uh, if not, go to our website and Search for Sophie Strand and you'll find the link to her. Thank you. There. Really helpful. Um, anybody else, would, would anyone else like to come in with a comment or? Can I just ask you, Sophie, 
I, I'm, I'm assuming that work never ends, <laughs> that it's part of your life all the time, that it, it's so integrated that um, it might be like a, a running diary, which is um, words, but you must be feeling and working all of the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Yes, um, definitely. And I think um, that's one of the things, that's how it kind of developed is because I could grab five minutes here and 10 minutes there when Frida was very little. Um, and now I have um, my studios in my garage. So again, it's, it's, it works well for me. And also having a, a chronic illness, it, it, it's sort of come out of this need to face the fact that I do need to be slow and, um, but it's, so it's very, very gentle, but it doesn't really stop. Well, but I like it like that. Absolutely stunning work. Really well, thank stunning. you. Really, really. It, it's exuding um, something that's metaphysical because of the way that you're doing it and the materials that you're, you're using. Really fabulous. Well, thanks, Ellie. That means a lot. It's really yeah. nice to share. I, I haven't, um, you know, with COVID, I haven't really shown them to very many people, so... Uh, there's a question from Alice. Uh, Alice is our materialist here today. So she <laughs> says, um, uh, is the Morden Alan? Is the Morden Alan? Yes. Um, I'm just going to move because I'm... My, my uh, battery. Um, oh. The Morden is um, <laughs> tannic acid um, or gall nuts, basically. And then, so one step, two step process of, of gall nuts and then alum and soda ash. Oh, good. So I do, I do gall nuts, and then I do, and then a bath of gall nuts, and then a bath of um, alum and soda ash, and then another of gall nuts, because it's um, made of plant-based materials. If it was silk or something, you wouldn't need to add it so so much. Oh, for Thank those you. of us who are not textile artists, describe what the mordant does in the process. Yes. Um, so it. Um, um, it sort of allows the, the plant to bite onto the canvas. And although eventually these plant, these, these, um, works will fade, um, it gives it, um, much more time. It allows it to, to, so to like a, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's not exactly a fixative. It's more a way of allowing the textile to accept them, the, the uh, material, accept them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everybody, we are out of time. Uh, we were having a lovely session, and thank you to uh, all the artists who joined us um, today. It's been really nice and uh, very rich. And uh, I have asked a favour of some of the, at least two of the artists, to put put more on the website. So once we've got that sorted, do come back, and we will also have this uh, recording of this session it will be up on the website too. Um, and just to say that although First Fridays happen every month, they don't because they don't happen in January. So uh, we will be back uh, in February. I can't remember the date now, but it's the first Friday in February. Lovely to see you all. Have a wonderful holiday period. Um, stay warm stay safe and all of that and um we'll see you next time thank you thanks bye bye thanks. bye